time. All right, y'all. Hey, well, um, I do want to give, uh, this will be episode 27 of the What's New with Mead podcast. And so I'm super excited to have you guys here. This is our call-in show for anyone on the stream right now who's not in here and you want to join us. It's on the Discord. So uh, we got a lot of people in here. Oh, this is awesome. We got Andrew, Basilisk, Blazer, Javier, Josh, Just Mike, Capern, Lomeric, Shaggy, Supernova, Texas Longhouse Mead, and the great Dunning Kruger. Whew, that was a mouthful. That was a lot of people. What do you guys got going on in your brew house? What's new? I just posted a picture of my uh, sour cherry mead just up in the uh, the general crowd there. Sweet. I'll have to get over to look at it real fast. I haven't uh, had a chance. Ooh, yeah, that, that looks good. I like the color on that. I've uh, yeah. bottled my first cask uh, mead. What was it? Say again, I'm sorry. I uh, bottled a uh, cask mead. Ooh, that's pretty sweet. How is it? Oh, it's way better than I thought it was going to turn out. <laughs> Man. Well, I, I, that sounds fun. I want to be able to do that at some point. Yeah, my, my buddy gave me his old cast that he used to make bourbon. Uh -huh. And then I put in mead. So it has like oak and meat and um, bourbon flavors to a traditional meat. Ooh, that sounds fantastic. That sounds yummy. Man. Yeah, it just when I, after two days, I tried a little bit and it tasted a little bit off. I was like, all right, let me just give it time hopefully <laughs> it's just time will work and uh no, it, it worked out well time definitely fixes a lot of problems that is for sure what else we got going hey, on beer i'm making a franz's kiner vice beer clone that's about it oh man i wish i had more time to brew beer i love beer i mean i love mead but beer is also very fun beer is good is that what you mainly brew at this point that is um i got into mead for my wife and well now i'm kind of doing it for me <laughs> yeah <laughs> no i understand that so what's your favorite kind of beer to brew then i like stouts um i'm trying to work out the kentucky breakfast stout recipe right now mm. um that's gonna be a hard one those are great though that is a good beer for sure yeah, two of those are enough. <laughs> I know that's that's a good thing about mead is most of the time when you make it, you can drink a glass and be good. Um, I mean, sometimes though you can you make seven percenters and just have two or three. But beer, man, I think that's the, what I love most about beer is that you can make it and be done in a month, a month and a half normally. Whereas obviously we live in a different world. Well, it depends. There's this um, Chimay Red Ale clone I make. I mean, you can drink it right out of secondary, but, man, you really want to leave that sit eight, nine months. Yeah, yeah, it's true. There are some, especially bigger body, higher ABV, you want to for sure let set. But it depends on the style, I guess, like you said. So we got some beer going on. What else we got? Anyone got to make anything crazy? Got a Polish meat going on. Polish, ooh. But what's the, is the Polish meat have a, like, is it just called the Polish meat or does it have some weird name? So it has a bunch of different weird names depending on the amount of honey that you use. Uh huh. So you can have like a one to one ratio, one to two ratio, one to three, obviously. Interesting. And then each one has its own different name. And then uh, what they kind of do is at different points in time, you would have it at a different type of honey source. So, say for example, you start fermenting in the first week, you have say one type of honey say like we'll say yeah i don't know uh just a regular say clover honey then week two as it's currently fermenting with that honey you would say add uh i don't know maybe uh like a darker honey or something like that and it would just start changing the the flavor profiles of the of the actual meat itself so you can end up adding like so five six different types of honey within the mead at various points and it would give uh, a more deeper richer flavor interesting so are you step feeding like you're you're doing it for flavor but in a way are you trying to also step feed to a certain abv yeah so usually that abv will be about uh like 19 <laughs> percent man that's a hot mead <laughs> oh wow 
Yeah, sounds like a sip of me there. That is that's a rough. I'm trying to push one to 25. There's a um, the YLP099 from White Labs. It's uh, an ale yeast. It goes up 25%. I'm trying to push mine or that yeast up to 25, and it is my other ones. I got up to like 16, and they taste like rocket fuel, but they also fermented um, with lots of stress. So we'll see how this one turns out. So when you, when you make something so high, do you have to feed it honey through like? at secondary and then again next week or yeah so how does that work so what i for this one um this is time number three the first time i i tempted it i bought the yeast and i i started the gravity i just threw them in lava basically i started at 1.164 i mean that four is, is a rough estimate because most hydrometers don't go that far so it was a super hot mead to start with super high gravity it fermented to like 1040 and then just died um, the second time I did it, I uh, started at like uh, 1.100, let it ferment out completely, and then tried to add the honey in, and it also had died. And what I learned is that in the step feeding process, if you if you don't add more honey prior to the end of fermentation, the yeast will have a harder time uh, recovering and starting up again. So this time I've done it, I started at one point. 090 when it hit 1.030 i added a bunch of honey when it hit 1.30 again um i hit added more honey so i'm just i'm not letting it go dry each time you have to add it when it's almost done now would you add more nutrients or even more yeast uh at one point as well or no more you, would... I, you don't have to do more yeast i don't believe especially with something graded to go up to 25 um now you if you were trying to do i'm sure you could add a secondary yeast on top if yours like capped at 14 but you do i have added some nutrient um in this process like i've been real careful about it though because i don't want to add too much i've been adding fermate o which is less scary if you added like dap that would be where it gets real scary got it so yeah don't they say with Polish meads, you make it now for your kids to drink? <laughs> yeah, you do have, it, it is a longer process for sure. It's like a two, three year process. Oh man, that's 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 fun though. I mean, you got something to look forward to. Exactly. I don't know if I could wait that long. You just gotta make <laughs> more mead. You only one. You gotta do it. Like, you know, have three or four on the go all the time. Yeah, you just gotta you gotta make more while you're waiting. Exactly. You got to have a monthly meet and then a yearly meet and then a multi-year meet. <laughs> oh, a decade meet, man. <laughs> <laughs> There's your one for your wedding. There we go. I'm working on that one. Okay. The honeymoon, right? <laughs> yeah. I'll, uh, I'm trying to uh, brainstorm mine. I talked about it last week, but um, I, I don't have the fermenters to do it right now. So that's that's my big drawback. But also, I want to make sure and get like super high quality honey and ingredients because it's going to be around for 25 years. So if I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to skimp. That's for sure. So I was wondering, uh, have you ever done uh, like a, kind of like a roundup of the like the International Mazers Cup? Like, you know, tested some of the, the, the ones that won for the year? I haven't. That, that does sound really fun, though. Um, I... I would love to like i actually haven't thought about that that seems pretty fun um i'm sure that that like with this podcast it'd be fun to get some of those people on you know i did reach out to uh, uh he wasn't he didn't get first place but it was a guy i saw him on the mead um facebook page he had posted a like two or three photos of some um of awards he'd won and so he got in like third or third place in a couple things and so i reached out to him to try to get him to come on the podcast and i did it through facebook so i don't think he recognized that it was somebody he thought i was spam but um i would love to chat with those people and then attempt to make their stuff i think that'd be pretty fun obviously they're doing cool things yeah have you ever done a, an agave mead yet or a maple mead? I ha I haven't done an agave. I am working with um, maple. That's that's my next big one. Honestly, the problem in uh, is, is getting enough maple syrup. It's just super expensive, and you want to make sure, of course, to get nice quality. So 
I plan on doing a a Acer Glen at some point soon. I do have some. Uh, I posted it on my Instagram. It's this uh, maple syrup infused with habanero chili peppers. That it only came in like a 12 ounce container. But I'm planning on back sweetening like a something with it because it would be really interesting to have that. It's actually pretty spicy, but it, it's pretty cool. I'm hoping that soon um, my, my mom, when she goes to Puerto Rico, she gets this guava honey. Ooh, yeah. That's delicious. And so she has a guy and she said she'll bring me some. I'm hoping to try to get a gallon to okay. make some stuff. That would be awesome. I would love to do the agave thing. Um, honestly, I don't. I haven't tried to source it out yet. That's part of my step one is to find out where I can get it, and where I can get good stuff. I haven't done a lot of investigating. So I have a lot of video ideas and um, not enough carboys. That's where I'm at. I'm gonna ask you, what would be enough carboys instead of curiosity? <laughs> oh man. Um, honestly, I'm running at a one gallon. It's well, I'll put it this way: if I had like ten more carboys. Like I would, it, I'd have 10 more carboys, but I wouldn't have the space. And again, I know that I'm very fortunate to be able to have a brew room. So I don't want to ever say that I'm like, man, I don't have enough. Uh, but I, I don't have enough places to put the one gallon carboys. And I'm getting to the point where my table that I set everything on, when I leave finishing my video stuff, it becomes piled with things. So I'm just constantly moving things off the table and back on the table. So if I had more space for carboys, I would be able to do whatever I want. But it's uh, that's the big problem. So I got to close down a couple projects before I can do anything new. Time to add a wing onto the house. <laughs> oh man, I wish. Yeah. Maybe so. Maybe so. I'm still trying to convince my fiance. We're we're house hunting now. There's a good chance I'm probably gonna um, have to move my brewing operation to another place. Which I'm dreading quite a bit, to be honest. But uh, trying to figure out a place for brewing things has been interesting. So then you can maybe have a good basement for uh, for brewing. Oh yeah, yeah. We found this house the other day that was like uh, it had a basically a kitchen, it had a, a basement, but it had a kitchen essentially in the basement, and this huge like living room and all this stuff. It would have been perfect, but then it it sold. So we were kind of bummed. Well, I was bummed. Mm. I, I don't know about her, but I was bummed. Yeah, that's uh, a man cave there. <laughs> exactly. Sounds like it. <laughs> I, I live in Florida, and uh, I basically lived here all my life, so I don't. I've never really been in a basement for too long. Mm -hmm. And now that I brew, uh, I would really like a basement. That that would be fantastic. Unfortunately, my my fiance is marrying somebody who uh, has too many hobbies. Between this, which I already have a ton ton of stuff from it and all the music equipment in the other room um there's a lot of things to to uh find a home so it's a little bit complicated hey my wife married one of them <laughs> mine too i remember uh, in one of your episodes you mentioned that uh you had a hard time getting some good quality honey have you ever thought of uh like sponsoring a beehive or anything like that i haven't um i've used uh, actually found a, a guy well i haven't had a big conversation with them but i found some nice quality honey that's probably i say close to me it's a hundred miles away from me <laughs> but um that i would love to do that with i just got to reach out to them the other people other beekeepers around me uh their honey is super expensive i talked to a guy who wanted it was like some it was just like a, a wildflower not even a crazy varietal of honey he wanted uh, 450 bucks for 60 pounds. And I was like, there's no way I can't do that. So yeah, I have not collaborated with them yet. Maybe one day. How much, how, how much would, do you think is a good price for, um, 60 pounds? Uh, if you get it online, you can get it pretty cheap. I just got uh, 60 pounds of blueberry honey for about with shipping is about 200 bucks. Um, oh, wow. and that's, that's blueberry honey. So it's, a more rare quote varietal i would say um if you're getting like a wildflower you can get it for even cheaper like dutch gold honey is one that i used a lot um and i still use but they have good prices and you can get 60 pounds 
depending on your shipping, between a hundred and seventy to two hundred dollars um, for that. It even varietals within that. So it just depends on where you go. Local beekeepers, of course, we need to support them, but it's hard to support them when they're, you know, they don't, they're having to upcharge a lot. So it, it sucks. It's it's a lose lose in a lot of ways. Yeah, if you're if you're interested, there, there's one up here in Canada. If you want to, it's eighty pounds of honey for in America, it'd be uh, five hundred fifty bucks. Oof. Then you get your own hive. Oh man. Uh, one, yeah, maybe I'll have uh, hives in the future and not have to worry about this. Although I'd have to have a lot of hives. It'd be pretty rough. Well, I got twenty acres. I'll split it with you. <laughs> acres live on next door. <laughs> oh yeah, man, that sounds like a, that sounds fun to me. I'm gonna fix uh, one light real fast. Y'all keep chatting. I'll be right back. So am I the only uh, out of country guy over here? <laughs> yeah, you might be. Yep, sounds like it. Yeah, I guess. You know, so speaking of, on, I just had another thing about for for they were talking about honey and stuff like that. And have you? Yeah, well, I, I'm kind of curious to see what people's weigh-in is of the uh, the fact that they always say you know you're supposed to buy these really expensive varietals because they say some of the other honey you're going to buy from other sources is probably fake or could possibly be fake. You guys have any input on that? Yeah, there's, there's a there's actually a huge documentary about fake honey out there. Uh, you can actually get it on like Netflix. It's a lot of like uh, rice syrup from China. Yeah, I think it's gold something. I can't remember the title. I know what you're talking about though. Yeah, yeah. So is it is I mean I, the stuff that you're that you're actually buying here like in the U.S. Um, yeah. Should I be concerned with possible, you know, syrup instead of honey? Yeah, one hundred percent. All right. Now is that something they would have to list on the label because it's no. They don't oh, have to. oh, interesting. So if, if, you're paying, if you're paying like under, what I would say, like if you're paying like under like ten bucks for, uh, let me just do the math here. As as the Canadian, uh, if you're doing yeah, if you're paying like under ten bucks for two pounds of honey, you're probably getting rice syrup. One of the things too is most of it does come from China. But they'll yeah. ship it somewhere else, bottle it there, and then import it to the U.S. Yeah, and they'll say that's from that location, yeah. Yeah, I've been using a lot of stuff that I've been buying at Costco, and so I've always got a concern because it's a really good price. Oh, yeah, that, that, I, I wouldn't buy it from the Costco. <laughs> I believe it's honey.com or honey.org. You can find local beekeepers usually. Mm -hmm. It's it's a honey.com, uh, and there is a... Um a verifier of some sort i'm trying to remember what it is there's like some some specific little check mark if it's on a honey then it has been 100 percent verified is 100 percent real all of that stuff there's no fake stuff in it now i don't know how many places have that same sticker um but i do know if you see like the gold check or the green check mark whatever it is that you're buying 100 percent honey Honey that you get at Costco, the Kirkland honey, has that True Source certified sticker. Yeah, right. I do think that there are some places that, like, I don't want to say anything against the Costco honey because um, I think that it's a viable thing for people, and obviously they are getting a good price on it. I don't really know if it's just a deal that somebody's got a million beehives and they have too much honey or what, but maybe that's the case. Hopefully, that's the case. I've had good luck with Costco giving better quality stuff. They seem to care more mm -hmm. than other stores. I do trust the Kirkland brand. They've been really good to us here, especially for diapers and wipes when you have a kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't forget the toilet paper. Oh, man. Oh, baby formula too, man. Don't buy baby formula anywhere else but there. I'll have to remember that. Because <laughs> I, I, Sam's, uh, what's their brand? I can't remember what it is. Maybe it's not... There's like Nature Nates. That's the honey you can get from Sam's. That's okay. I've used it for some stuff. Um, but I don't know. I think it's, if you can find local honey that's cheap, then great. But most people are not in that situation, especially if you're in some like small town in the middle of, you know, America, you're probably not going to find the nicest honey or the best uh, priced honey around you. So you might have to go and buy online or something. 
Now you use that uh, Dutch gold. You're pretty happy with that. I only ask because they're very close to where I live here. So it'd be nice to make a run up there and grab. I, I love Dutch gold. Honestly, um, one reason I haven't used him a lot, th this feels weird. I feel like I ordered almost too much honey from him because every time I would go to the website, I've been like blacklisted. Like it won't, the website won't load and it says like some other thing. And so this last time I bought from them, I had to physically call them and say, Hey, I need 60 pounds of alfalfa or uh, avocado blossom honey. And they of course got me their stuff, but I tried to get on the website again and it, they must've uh, said no to me. I guess I've, I don't know, but I love them. They got great prices. They have good varietals. You can get um, pretty interesting stuff for cheap. Like, I love Avocado Blossom Honey. Probably the best place for me to get it. Uh, yep. Would you be able to post that website? Mm-hmm. I'll and throw it in the also chat. also the website where you got um, the blueberry, if you don't mind. Yes, yes, yes. I will post both into the chat right now. The That's in the chat. And hold on, I got to get to the other one. It was Crystal's Honey. Also another... I've only bought from, from this site. I say her. I'm... I'm sure it's a uh, crystal is the person who owns the place, but um, I haven't tried the other varietals. I have their blueberry from crystals, honey, and both have been really good. So I can't swear by crystals, but I can say Dutch gold is good. There is the, the shipping for 60 pounds of honey is steep. So I see somebody saying that in the chat. It is pretty steep, unfortunately, but it is, Expense. It is a lot of honey. I would not like to be that person delivering it. <laughs> yeah, that, that would break your back. I felt bad for the guy. He delivered it like probably four or five days ago, and it was snowing. And uh, yeah, that was not. I felt I felt pretty bad for him. So, have you ever brewed with uh, tea at all? Yeah, um, actually, I've been doing it more recently, but uh, I use, I've started to use like maybe a cup to three cups, depending on how much tannin I want to add to a, uh, for each, for some brews. So for example, I started a, um, I have a Tupelo uh, traditional mead I'm working on, and I, I made it just as it was. Um, I didn't add any tea or any tannic element to it and i tasted it and went man i wish it had more tannin value so i've in the same video i'm revamping the recipe and starting with two cups of black tea as the base um because i believe that the the tannic value from tea will add enough body slash mouthfeel to really um uh, forego the need for other elements now i might have to add some other things hopefully not wine tannin or anything like that but I think it'll help uh, round out the mead. So do you do you just put like it dried into um, your bus or do you like um, would brew it first and then add it to uh, to the must afterwards? Yeah, um, normally I am brewing it and adding it in. Now I know that it is an option to, of course, put a tea bag in the must and that stuff. But I, I worry a little bit about oversteeping in that regard. So, um, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Now, do you, um, do you hot or um, brew it, or do you have you tried cold brewing it? I've never cold brew cold brewed a tea and then put it into a mead. Um, normally hot. That's I try to follow whatever style it is, and I'm not a tea person. Somebody else can speak to this better than me, but I know that like green tea, you're supposed to steep at 160 degrees for two minutes or whatever stuff like that. So. Um, yeah, if, if you do it for too long, it increases the tannic value and kind of have like more of an astringent taste. Yeah, and you don't want to do that. No. Yeah, de definitely. Yeah, I find with uh, at least I've done it with uh, black tea mostly uh, when I was doing kombucha. And um, I, I would actually make cold brew and do it for 24 hours and they come out pretty well. Mm. Yeah. No, I think that uh, uh, it, it is very valuable. If you want to... Uh, I'll, I'll say naturally without having to add anything else add some tannic value body to your mead a little bit of tea will help now I've never done like a full on tea base like complete tea mead but I I think it would be interesting possibly good 
I only ask because like I've thought about doing some sort of like um, honor Palmer mead. Oh yeah, kind of thing. Mhm. Mm I think that'd be really good though. So. Yeah, the first uh, the first actual mead I made, which was kind of a traditional, I used uh, I used tea um, in my five gallons. So I just did basically I used about six cups of tea, and uh, you know everybody that's ever had it has been really happy with it. So it's a. Uh, especially if you use different varietals of tea, obviously, if you have different purpose purposes. Um, I haven't experimented and, you know, A-B tested what does green tea do and what does black tea, what does, you know, all these other things do. But I do think generally it adds a fair amount to a mead. I'll try this out. Thank you. Yeah, of course. I'm happy to help. I would love to. That makes me now Mar the wheels are spinning. Like, okay, now I got to get a test going to try different teas and see what they do. <laughs> oh, man. So I, I got a question. Who in here is going to enter the meat stampede? Oh, I am. I encourage oh. everybody to do it. That'd be awesome. I've been going back and forth, but um, I just restarted doing uh, mead maybe like a month or two ago. So I'm. Uh... Uh, of course, yeah, thing. Like hey, you got time, man. You you got plenty of time. What is the mead stampede? So the mead stampede is the uh, well, I'll, I'll say the newest mead competition. Um, I'm sure there are lots. There's another one that came out right after ours. But myself and doing the most um, have partnered together to put on this mead competition. So it will be um, hosted early June in that we will do our tastings and things. So it is a place and way for you to submit meads and basically get some feedback on your mead making. Now, uh, you can submit anything within our certain style guide. There's a website, and I'll even put it in the chat right now, um, to find out all the requirements. You, ha you do have to ship mead, and I know that some people are worried about the legality of that, but it is truly legal if you follow the right steps and go through the right companies. If you try and ship through, like, USPS, they'll say, no, sorry about you. But if you go through FedEx or an alcohol-approving agency, they will um, let you do it. So it's a mead competition um, that we are doing for the first time this year, and it's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait. Okay, looking forward to that link. Yeah, I'm trying. Sorry, I'm trying to get to it right now. Multitasking oh, and uh, I'm obviously not very uh, very good at multitasking with this. Also, trying to make sure I get. There we go. Oh, every time I touch my computer, I worry about it exploding, not because of anything it does wrong. Um, there we go. So it's in. I'll spam it a couple more times. Feel free to join us for the <laughs> Mead Stampede. Um, that will be in early June, but it's going to be a whole lot of fun. I think we already have um, 30 people. Was it 30 meads, maybe? I can't recall, but 30 entries logged. So we I don't believe there's a cap right now. <laughs> uh, so unless, you know, the whole world goes crazy, I, I don't think we'll hold a cap. I volunteered a taste test. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited for that. So, um, let's see, I see somebody put in the comments another, oh, someone was talking about Dutch gold. So what do we, what else we got going on in the chat, y'all? Anything exciting? Got a lavender going on too. Say again, I'm sorry. Oh, I, saying, I got a lavender meat going on too, but, uh, I don't, uh, I don't have the high hopes for it to be honest. How have you imparted the lavender to it? So there's actually a lavender farm not that far away from where I live. Uh huh. So I actually have like the actual lavender in the uh, the, the meat itself as it's fermenting. Interesting, interesting. And you're doing it within the primary? Within the primary, yeah. It's still in the primary. So it's only about three and a half weeks in. Okay. But uh, hmm. to be honest, I, like I don't, I don't have any scent from it when I uh, kind of like open it up a bit. I don't have any scent. Uh, there's no taste or anything like that of it. So it's not really imparting as much 
flavor as I thought it might. Yeah, I wondered about that because the primary, especially depending on your yeast, is super vigor vigorous. Um, there's a good chance you'll blow off some of those essential flavor profiles, um, th and that's not to dissuade you. I just that's my no. my biggest fear with that is like, man, what if? Well, I wonder if you were to add some more in that secondary stage or even an aging stage, if there would be a greater impartation of it. Yeah, it, it, was, it was just this was more like an experimental meat type of thing. Oh, it's great. Oh, I love that. I'm very curious. Um, you have to let me know how that turns out after the primary. Um, like you said, now you can't really taste too much or smell too much of that aroma. I'm curious if it uh, if it pops up on the actual palate or not. Mm. Because that seems yeah, interesting. Next, I have uh, elderflower, so it's another like floral meat. So we'll see what. But I'm gonna mix it with like elderflower and elderberry, to see to kind of like hopefully it imparts a, a, a stronger flavor. Yeah. So, so that's the uh, that's the next one. You're going for more floral, right? Uh, just because I have I, I was able to obtain a lot of it uh -huh. to actually make it. So if if it was not, I, I would have made that uh, uh, maple meat type of thing. You should, if you have the availabil availability, goodness, I can't talk, um, to get alpha alpha blossom honey, I think you can maybe get a small batch of it or a small, you know, three pound container online. That will impart a ton of that floral variety. Um, I have actually, I've been thinking about this today because I have a, an alpha alpha blossom traditional mead that's been sitting for a year. I haven't done anything with it. I've just been real lazy and I'm, I need to start revamping another video a part two for it because I did a part one over a year ago and haven't done anything with it since. So, uh, but it is a awesome varietal of honey that I think is super is it interesting. Alfalfa? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually do get, am able to get alfalfa honey. So alfalfa honey for me is like, so once again, I'm, I'm in Canada. So uh, it's like 12 bucks. So 12 Canadian for a, a kilo. So that's like two pounds. Uh huh. So I guess that'd be like seven dollars for two pounds or something like that. Yeah. So it's not it's not that expensive uh, for here. Like we, we we make a lot of meat. We make a lot of honey over here. So same with maple syrup. It's another. Dude, I would get that. I would back sweeten with some of it and see what you what you think. I think it'll add that extra pop that you're wanting. Of course, add your other flavors, but adding that will help it pop. Mm -hmm. That's what I would do, but. And especially if you have it locally or locally slash available, um, that's great. I wish I could get it, you know, more easily for me. I have to get online, of course, and do it. I, I'm like right down the street from a meadery, so uh, oh. I, I, I talk with them a lot, so that we're able to work out some stuff. Dude, I'm envious. Here in Oklahoma, we have zero. I mean, we don't have zero meaderies. We have um, one, and it is in. It is. Uh, 80 miles away from me and I've contacted them and they've never gotten back to me and I've done things but uh, so I don't have anyone local to me it'd be nice to have somebody I could just talk shop with and go and taste their stuff <laughs> but oh yeah that's that's like that's like a, a, a huge component of being super close to me like a, another uh, mazer I guess you would call it mm -hmm. uh, and just like just talking shop they're actually gonna be opening and it's like uh, almost like a bar, but it's only going to have mead, like an outdoor bar that only has mead just to Ooh. talk shop with all the other people in the area too. That sounds so good, dude. <laughs> Post-COVID, of course. Post-COVID. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> but man. It's, it's, it's already actually built. They just need the uh, the, the, the go-ahead from the, the COVID peoples. That would be so cool. Dang. Yeah. This is where I... I like Oklahoma, but we, ha we are not great about many things. That's for sure. <laughs> Well, like I said last time we talked, Meg, you get down here, we'll t take a trip up to Superstition Meadery. Oh my gosh, I would love to go tour. They they have some wild stuff. It is an, um, the creative minds behind Superstition are insane to me. They are so cool. I do. Question, th yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Are oh, you good? Go ahead. I was gonna say wine. I'm trying to make. There's this flavor profile I want to get mm -hmm. and lime is one of the things and vinegar but I'm thinking I could leave that out mm -hmm. lime and meat how does that work uh, it's very similar to lemon in that using it in the primary uh, affects your pH we kind of talked about that earlier I don't know if you were in the chat but pH and, and yeast fermentation can kind of combat if it's too acidic um, but I would I think 
if I were making a lime specific mead or a mead with lime as a primary flavor, I would add it half of my ratio in the primary and then let that ferment, of course, do its thing and then come back in the secondary and see what's changed and then um, adjust from there and maybe add my other quote ratio. So whatever, it, what I would do is whatever my beginning thought of how much I need to add is, I'd half it and then add more later. Uh, the zest could be interesting. The juice, of course, will have its own flavors, but I think the zest and the peel will add that tannic value that will add some extra complexity to your mead. Um, so, yeah, I, I would use half primary, half secondary, possibly half secondary. Just kind of play it by, play it by palate. Okay, so good. Jared, have you ever thought of... Uh collaborating with another like established mead youtube channel yeah no i'm like, so, like, uh, like kings of mead or some of the other ones out there yeah so um one of the big ones i spend a lot of time with is doing the most and it's funny enough um uh him and i are in the echelon of things i guess the mead world's pretty small in, in all reality but him and i are like two and three in the the um mead world and so like we both live in Oklahoma City, and so it's pretty interesting that we both live here and we collaborate quite a bit. Like this past video, Thursday was him and I taste testing meads um, that were mysteries to us and trying to figure out what's happening. So we do a lot of stuff. Obviously, we do the, the, the mead stampede. Uh, aside from him, um, I would love to collaborate with people. I'm all about doing stuff. Uh, I've reached out, uh, actually to some other people for podcast episodes and some stuff like that. And I'm waiting on some responses, but I would love to, I'd love to do more with other people. The community is what makes mead fun. Of course it's fun to drink and make, but learning from one another for me at least is, is one of the more fun things. So I'm all about it. I mean, not to keep bringing it back to superstition, but I'm reading their menu for their downtown place a couple miles from here. Uh huh. A prickly pear mead. Ooh, yeah. Well, that sounds pretty good. I, I would love to make one of those. That's been requested on the channel many times. I just don't know how to get prickly pear to me. That might end up tasting more watermelony than watermelon. Yeah. Come take the prickly pears out of my yard, please. <laughs> Just box them up, ship them my way. I'll pay the shipping. <laughs> I might do that. Do, do it, man. I would. That'd be great. I I have no access to them here, so I'm pretty out of luck. So somebody asked earlier, um, is there a fruit or something that you've made that just has not worked. I want to ask that to you guys here in the call-in show. Is there something, a ingredient you've used in your mead making process that in your personal opinion has not worked? Now, again, I'm emphasizing personal opinion because some people might disagree with you, but again, it's personal opinion. Is there something that didn't work? Well, I'm not going to say really a fruit per se, but more of how the fruit was processed. And uh, I mentioned it uh, a few weeks ago when you had a live stream, uh -huh. but that was using um, a mango nectar to mm. try to get mango flavor in a mead. And, and it's sitting over there and I'm just not happy with it. So <laughs> what, what's, uh, what went wrong? Um, you know, it, 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 you know, it's just, it, there's some off smell to it or something It's you know, I don't, it's not bad. It's just, it's not what I expected to get out of mango. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, I've been kind of sitting here thinking about it and trying to figure out what I want to do with it. Um, and it's, it's a very small batch, so it's not a big deal, but. So what, uh, what yeast did you use? Do you recall? Uh, I believe that was, uh, Lavin, uh, what was that? that the, uh, yeah, B71. The 71B, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good general yeast. Interesting. I was going to say some, some yeasts are not as keen to fruits but that one should theoretically be fine that's interesting yeah I think if i had to do it over again i think i would go with like a mango puree instead of a mango nectar because the amount of you know sediment and weeds at the bottom was just you know uh, it was atrocious there was so much there so mm -hmm. well, i'll say a puree would be the same way um like your only way to get it completely away from uh lots of sediment is to go with like a extract of some sort which then you have your own problems you know within that regard 
So it's interesting. So when I um when I was first starting to do meads, um probably like my third batch of just trying to make something random. Mm-hmm. Um I uh I, I did watermelon and mead and it was like almost it came out almost syrupy. I, I don't know what I did to it, but uh this is like years back. Um and since then I haven't really tried it. I might try to do uh, another watermelon uh this year. But yeah, it, I, I have a few bottles left and it's still just it's it's like syrupy and hmm. water, just gross. Did you use real watermelon? Yes. How did you watermelon. how'd you process it? What'd you do? Um I put it all in a blender. I mm-hmm. uh, blend it um so i like to make a uh, watermelon juice during uh the summer mm-hmm. so i just did it the same way i blended it then afterwards i uh, um strained it all mm-hmm. and put it right in there as is with uh some a little bit of water and it just, just did not come out well um but at mm-hmm. the same time interesting this is before i started listening to uh, ask the meat maker mm-hmm. and once i like listened to ask the meat maker i leveled up like 10 levels <laughs> from like when I started listening to everything he said and then all of a sudden they did it, it my how my meat tasted and like just just changed completely. Yeah. No, I think that uh, one watermelon is super tough to use. I know that there are in some ways it sounds bad. It's almost dangerous to use only because if you don't um, if you don't add your yeast at the right time, if you don't ferment it at the right temperature, it is super susceptible to bacteria. There's something about the watermelon juice slash the fruit itself that is like bacteria love. So the uh, probability of it growing mold in some regard is like super high. So you have to really do the right things in order to make it work. Um, it's also like, I mean, it's a, it's a fruit that is all water, but you have to use so much of it to get your base. So unless you're watering it down watering your watermelon down you know that just it doesn't work super well <laughs> yeah i like i said i think i might try it again um i think this time uh this is before i was adding like either citric acid or mm-hmm. even like some sort of uh, some sort of acid to it i think that would have helped a lot mm-hmm. um I, I i think how i i strained it out and everything i think that would work well and maybe I might even do like adding a cabinet tablet for 24 hours before put, well, putting yeast might yeah. help. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like I can overcome and still use actual watermelon to uh, mm-hmm. make a, a decent mead. I think so too. I think that's great. And I don't want to dissuade you from using real watermelon. In fact, if I, like I talked about earlier, I have a watermelon hydromel that I've been making. The only reason I use the syrup or the uh, flavoring from Amoretti is because one, I can't get watermelons right now, but two there, I just, the accessibility to them is not super easy. So uh, yeah, I would definitely use real ones. They are hard to use, but if you can master it, you can almost write a book about it, man. You will make a million dollars off that book because everybody (laughs) wants to make a watermelon mead in a great way. I think my uh, weird ingredient that I used was actually uh, fenugreek. I don't know if you've ever used it at all, uh-huh, but uh, uh-huh. it, it, did, it didn't do as much of a solid flavor. But when I added things like uh, sarsaparilla root and things like that, I made like a, a root beer meat, which actually mm-hmm. tasted really good. Oh, send me that recipe, please. <laughs> that's, yeah, that sounds delicious. How did you how did you use the fenugreek seeds? So I, I boiled it. I had I had to you basically boil it into almost like a tea, as well as I added the, uh, like the sarsaparilla root. Okay. as well as a, a couple other different roots. Like you, you can taste like a couple different, like you can, someone told me to add like birch root, but you know, you, you have to kind of like taste and see, everyone's taste palate is a little bit different, but uh, you boil all the roots plus the fenugreek, hmm. and then you kind of uh, use that as like a tea format yeah. into the uh, the uh, the mead. And then someone actually took some of that, a portion of that mead, that, that root beer mead that I made and actually added uh weird thing they added lactose to it interesting it actually made it like thickened it up a bit Uh uh-huh it uh it also it has a little bit of sugar as well but the yeast actually doesn't kill lactose if you ever try if you ever wanted to know something about Mm -hmm. that if you were to add lactose to a meat it 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 retains the sweetness value but Mm -hmm. it actually doesn't kill the sweetness but uh yeah that was like a one-off thing that i did to kind of like correct a a weird mistake with the fenugreek (laughs) 
That's interesting because I my first mead competition I ever did was the mead house and the they did a secret ingredient and so the secret ingredient was fenugreek, and I I kind of went off the wall and um honestly I just started throwing darts and so my mead ended up being a pear, cilantro and fenugreek mead, and it was pretty wild. Um, cilantro. Yeah. <laughs> so. I, I don't know what prompted me at the time. I think this was like the, this was about two years ago. Um, and I think this was like the beginning of my thoughts of can it be a mead? So I just would I just wanted to throw the world into a, a container. So that's interesting. I watch the world burn. <laughs> hey, it was fun. It was a learning experience for sure. But I heard people have talked about using fenugreek seeds and actually roasting them like in a pan to get more of um, they're, they're supposed to create like kind of a maple mapley um, caramely kind of uh, taste to them, especially if you roast them. So that was one big thing that I heard after the fact is all these people and, you know, like even the winning recipes, they mentioned I roasted them in a pan for 10 minutes prior to putting them in and they put them in whole. So. It's just an interesting thing. Um, I had never met or seen somebody, heard somebody who have who has used them as well. So that's kind of fun, especially we willingly. Uh, we do things different here in Canada. <laughs> hey, that's great. That's awesome. Somebody's got to do it. What does roasting do to a mead? Uh, like roasting the ingredient. Um, I think depends on the ingredients. Uh, in that case, with the seeds, the fenugreek seed, because it looked like a what, are you, what would you call that? I don't know, some tiny little seed of some sort. But it probably added some extra that I mean, roasty flavor. Quote that sounds real, real cool. But also, I bet it it pulled some of the possible oils out. Also, it um, I can imagine that it it just like. I don't know the exact terminology, but I'm sure it changed the the chemistry inside of that thing if you did it for long enough. That's my roasting, fancy word. Roasting usually caramelizes the sugars and brings them more to the surface. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, like roast, roasting cacao nibs, if you just throw cacao nibs into a meat or whatever, it actually is bitter, but if you roast them, it's something about it that actually brings forward the chocolate flavor and everything like that. I think that's that. That's that sweetness. You know, you're pulling the sweetness out. That's that's already there. So um, that's interesting. I, I want to do that at some point. Roast some cacao nibs. Yeah. It's like when you caramelize onions, you know, it just pulls that sugar out and puts it on the surface to be sucked right off. True. True. And roasting cacao nibs, you don't have to do them very long. I put it on like a medium heat for about five minutes, and hmm. that's usually good to go after that. That's got to smell good. <laughs> oh, it, I, I usually do it for like a chocolate poche, and it's amazing. Mm. That's one of those. I, I have a, I call it the OK poche, but it's a chocolate and vanilla. And I've, I haven't roasted the cacao nibs yet, but that's next step is to roast them and see how that changes that. Um, recipe one of the meads i want to try on my own is i want to try a raspberry chocolate and that sounds like it might be a good first step is roasting those nibs yeah hmm you're, you're interesting roasting them you'll want to definitely put them in the secondary and not primary uh the, the, the twice i did it in primary the chocolate isn't quite the chocolate you would think and it kind of ruins the flavor if you're trying to get like the good solid chocolate flavor you definitely want to do it in the secondary yeah i would not recommend using them in the primary um to me any spice anything like that would be secondary worth i just i want to have complete control of a spice or of a extra flavor like that and i worry about the primary taking over too much Now, Texas, I got, I'm got. i on my second batch of brew, or mead, I should say, and I it was a very wonderful raspberry mead. It's very raspberry flavored. I was wondering, if I bottled it, if I threw some nibs in the bottle, would that impart the flavor to them if I let it sit for, say, two, three months? 
it would, but it, it would be, it would overpower it. Cause like every time that I've done like the chocolate or with cow nibs, I've only, I want to say it was like two ounces per gallon is what I ended up using. And I only, after toasting them for about five minutes, medium heat, they only, they only sat in there for, I don't think it was two weeks max. And that got to the chocolate flavor that I wanted. So I think if you leave them in there, like put it into a bottle and then in a couple months, check back on it. I think it would be too much. Now, if you, you know, if you underdose it, you know, just do a couple, like you were saying, a couple of cacao nibs. Uh, then, you know, a couple months, I think it'd be all right. But, it, you know, I haven't tried that per se. So. Well, I got four bottles. I might as well try it with one, right? <laughs> okay. Oh, back to the question, to your M question earlier about fruits that you went off. Mm -hmm. I made my first mead was a blood orange. Mm. I did not get the blood orange taste. I don't know. It's, I used bread yeast mm -hmm. recipe I found. So it tasted good, but it just the blood orange wasn't there. It did taste like citrus. But mm -hmm. I don't know if it was the yeast or what it was. Did you put it in the primary? I hate that I'm promoting that, but Yes, I did put the um, blood orange, everything in the primary. It was, it was my first meat. I put the raisins, I put the the blood oranges and everything all in the primary. I let that sit till it was done fermenting, wrapped it off into a secondary for about a month, then bottled it, let that sit for about another month, and then drank it. Mm -hmm. I really do think that there's just it, um, problematic things that come through the primary and not to say that you can't put things into the primary but there are delicate flavors and there's that like uh the blood orange flavor to me of course is that orange you know bright orange in some ways but then it is like it's pretty roasty to me it sounds weird that's probably not the right word for it but um the darkness you get from a blood orange gets lost in a, a primary fermentation and, and really any just vigorous fermentation it depends on your yeast like you said you could have been your yeast but if you use something that's like a fast champagne champagne yeast fermenter you're gonna lose a lot of things that's why some people uh some people hate like the lauvin uh ec1118 because it's a champagne yeast and it's a fast fermenter because it does have that same uh problem property quote now, I don't really know, obviously it depends on your yeast, but ultimately I prefer to put things into the secondary when possible, or both. <laughs> both is optimal, secondary is the most uh, common for me. Not to backtrack here, but I've just posted the, uh, the ingredients for that root beer mead using the fenugreek. The, uh, the measurements, you'll have to kind of figure out the measurements, but I put all the ingredients that I use. Uh -huh. So it has like, things like yeah, cinnamon sticks, dried sassafras, root bark, Sarsaparilla root, dried licorice root, dark cherry bark, and the fenugreek and ginger. So, for if you if people want to experiment with it, ooh, that sounds great. Yeah, that's in that's here in the uh, Discord. If you guys want to join and you're you're not currently in the Discord, um, I will post the link in the chat right now. Feel free to join us here. We're having fun getting the chat. It's a yummy looking recipe. You should jump over here and get it. Seriously though, <laughs> oh man. <laughs> One thing with like delicate fruits, you're talking about like blood oranges and stuff like that. Like my mango one, uh, right now I have it, I think it's 71B, just because I didn't have 347. Um, but with like a moderate uh, yeast like that, uh, fermenting yeast, 71B, D47, mm -hmm. uh, after the first week to like 10 days, once you know you start noticing the slow down, is usually when I'll put in, you know, citrusy fruits like that you know mangoes mm -hmm. oranges stuff like that so that way it doesn't blow off as much and you still get a good solid so that way you're not having to wait till secondary to add it and then, you know possibly re-fermenting and everything like that so yeah no that's one big thing I, i've heard a lot of people do is that passing uh really it's like the two-thirds sugar break you know when you get past let's say you start at 1.100 and your mead gets to 1.06 at six 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 all those things that's the one third that's like your yeast is kind of on their uphill climb they're going crazy when you get to like 1.0333 all those it's starting to slow down some and that's like probably the best time to add 
extra ingredients simply because there is less vigorous fermentation. Now that does require you to require you to watch your meat a little bit, which is uh, not always the most fun thing. But it is uh, that's what I've heard. I haven't done experimentation again. Probably gonna write some notes here. I got to start doing some more experimentation, but that's what I would recommend. Yeah, but like stuff with like that, that's super delicate, like vanilla. That you'll definitely want to put in the secondary because that'll get blown out so fast. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Delicate flavor, definitely a delicate flavor. Anything, I'll put it this way, anything that's expensive, any ingredient that you cringe at buying, don't put in the primary, put it in the secondary. Uh, if that's the case, some of the honey I look at. You, know, <laughs> <laughs> you could just start with water in the primary, in the secondary I'll get some, <laughs> put go. some honey in there. <laughs> A little air or some water, you know, hey, perfect meat, right? Yeah. Have you ever thought of making a, a full meal in a, in a mead? Someone kind of had that idea for me, like making like a blueberry pancake with a bacon mm. egg type of thing, like a full oh. full meal. Not not actually adding bacon, et cetera, et cetera, because obviously that'll that'll rot and stuff. But doing the some flavoring. some form, yeah, like oh. a, like a flavor that like you can kind of like at different points taste different flavors and stuff like that. Man, I hadn't thought about that. I was when you said blueberry pancake, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you said bacon, and I was like, okay, okay. And then egg, and then I kind of no, I, I, a lot. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just kind of like giving it as an example, but you know, like a, like a full meal type of thing. Yeah, that's no, fun. that's interesting. My first thought was like those stupid YouTube challenges where it's like, man blends full McDonald's Big Mac meal and eats it, and I was like, oh man, that sounds disgusting. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> You're doing something more logical like that, like a breakfast blend. That could be interesting. I have no idea how you'd achieve um, bacon flavor. I mean, I guess there are some, like, extracts and things you can use, but, like, to do it in a way that wasn't, quote, Yeah, don't do it. I've cheating. had bacon vodka before. It tasted absolutely nasty. No, no, I would avoid that. <laughs> yeah, I would think only by extracting, maybe doing extracting it yourself, in um, some alcohol, just bacon mm -hmm. might be the only way to to get that flavor. Yeah, I don't know. You would huh. you would want to make sure that the bacon is um, not floating ever. Just have some sort of weight to keep it down. Um, in the, uh, uh Yeah, anything that keep it down. Um, I, I I've done like pickling and stuff, and I I always I have these like um, glass hockey pucks looking things mm -hmm. that fit in mason jars and that's what i'll use uh when doing those things just to make sure it's uh submerged interesting the only problem with with bacon specifically is the oils like you'd have to figure out how to somehow completely get rid of all the oils because oils in that fermentation process even in the aging stage could be detrimental well, that would be if you if you made to extract in um, let's say like vodka, let's say, um, then you would mm -hmm. um, the, you would just have to skim off the oil from the top um, every few days as it's um, breaking down breaking down into the vodka. So I've made yeah. the vodka extract the vodka bacon before. You kind of got to wash it off because there's a lot of salt and the salt overpowers a lot of the Ooh, flavor. Yeah. Huh. So you kind of wash some of those fats off before you put it in. I didn't have to worry about it floating, but I filled up the mason jar with vodka. So that kind of solved that problem. Okay, it was mediocre at best. One of the things I found for getting the Don't grease off bacon, bacon either. <laughs> well, you see, no. I would have to try the bacon afterwards. It's a I terrible, did. terrible taste. like... <laughs> astringent oh man it was hilarious it just See, feels like your, your bacon and oats that'll get rid of a lot of the grease hmm interesting now you guys yeah this sounds like quite the experiment for sure hmm i know you know anything with like uh nuts? like uh like peanuts mm -hmm. brazil nuts cashews anything like that as of yet uh, I've done um, peanut butter uh, syrup before. I haven't used p 
peanut butter powder. I know that's a big one for some brewing recipes because it has no oils in it. Um, I've never used peanut butter, obviously. It has too much oil. Peanuts themselves, I, I just think the oil debacle is huge. I have used pecans. Now, of course, that is a nut in itself, but I had to go through a huge process to try and get the pecan to not have any oil in it, and it was a big pain. I mean, I had to... I boiled them for, like, 15 minutes, and I baked them for, like... Uh, like 10 to uh, what was it 20 minutes I, something like that in a decent amount of heat and then put them into the mead and by that point i think that they didn't really impart a lot of flavor i think a lot of the flavor was lost lost within the um oils surprisingly i i didn't consider that but i do think that there is some flavor profile within oil i know for peanut butter flavor there's a product called pb2 Mm. Uh, peanut butter stout with that is pretty good mm -hmm. I think some of the simpler ones like peanut butter have resolves but I do think that like weird things like pecan probably don't have a big resolve to them or have an alternative rather have you done anything, anything with uh, like Mediterranean uh, fruits like dates or like dried figs things like that haven't done anything with those yet um Namely because, like, I could get them, but they're, I mean, I'm sure I could get, we, it's the internet now. I could get anything I want. I can't complain. I can't use that as an excuse. I just haven't done it yet. One day. <laughs> Maybe one day. All right, y'all. So oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I, I was going to say, like, I, I seen uh, your, 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 I guess, the, the show last week, the live show, and someone mentioned the, uh, compote and uh that's actually how i did the that that cherry meat that i showed the picture of it i actually boiled all those cherries first and put it in rather than actually keeping the the whole cherries so mm. that, i think that's what's uh doing it because i think someone else even before me put their cherry meat up and that you can see that there's a difference in kind of color mm -hmm. versus uh the clarity like mine's a lot more thicker compared to theirs as well as it's a a, a much brighter color very interesting as well huh so it, it'd be interesting if maybe if you did like uh obviously not now you have no room but in the future <laughs> if you do like uh you know one one versus the other do you do the two different methods of the every keep everything else the same but have they like, just keep it the cherries whole versus as a, a compote or maybe even like have a blended version you know three different types not necessarily saying you have to use cherry you can use whatever mm -hmm. else you want but you know testing the three different methods out to see which one looks best tastes best etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah no that's one of my um goals one of my videos i'm going to start soon i, I want to put to test the dried fruit idea and try and get some dried whatever um i was looking at blueberry powder today <laughs> basically just dried blueberry powder compare that to real blueberries and see if there's any difference and do like an a b test um but adding that third variable you know what if you were to do a compote would be very interesting as well. I like that. That's kind of fun. Hmm. Now again, the wheels are spinning. I gotta, I gotta start writing these things down. Y'all have yeah, some you great only ideas. Got so much room. You only got so much room. Hey, you know what? I I got less, not a lot of room, but I, I can close some things down. I can get some stuff going. Don't worry. I mean, I got a, I got a hopefully a long YouTube career left. So hopefully in the time that before I'm done with this, uh, I'll make a video like that because that, that sounds like a lot of fun. I enjoy getting to do those for sure. So, yeah. All right, guys, I do need to close down the call-in show. Thank you guys for joining me here. I am going to hop off here and then I'll, I'll do just a few more things and then uh, hop off of the live stream. But thank you guys for hopping in the call-in show. I appreciate you. Um, this has been a lot of fun and I promise this is the, not the last time we'll do this. This is definitely not the last time it will be a podcast episode because you guys um, have some great ideas and you guys are doing really cool things. Honestly, more cool things than me to be completely fair. So I love getting to hear what you guys have in your brew house. Yeah, man, it was awesome. Thank you uh, for doing this. Of course. Yeah, thank you. Keep it oh, up. Enjoy it. Thanks, guys. Right. Appreciate Bye. you. Bye.